While the sorrow and anger fueling protests across the United States have certainly spread into this country as people take to the streets to protest anti-black racism and police brutality, from Victoria to Thunder Bay to Moncton and Halifax, thousands of Canadians are coming out to call for justice and equity. To fight white supremacy and to end its racism and internalized racism and systematic racism. No justice, no Black Lives Matters. 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 No peace. No peace. No peace. No peace. No peace. Black Lives Matters. Black Lives Matters. Black Lives Matters. Black Lives Matters. So again, those were the protests that we saw right across this country yesterday. And with much of the focus on the protests, though, earlier in the United States, there are some concerns that not enough is being done to fight racism here in Canada. And with a look at the roots of that, we've invited to the program today Kathy Hogarth. She's an associate professor at the University of Waterloo School of Social Work. She joins us right now in Waterloo, Ontario. Uh, Kathy, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for having me, Michael. Listen, I want to begin uh, with comments that we heard from political leaders this week. And we have to note the fact that Doug Ford, the Premier of Ontario, did roll it back. But he was amongst the political leaders earlier in the week who essentially said that systemic racism does not exist in Canada and certainly others saying that things are much better in this country than in the United States. I wonder, what is your physical and gut reaction when you hear that? It, that really stings in a particular way. One of the things I have often talked about, and many of us in this, this field have constantly tried to bring awareness on, is Canada's own legacy of racism. And so when our leaders speak to this fact that we don't have the level of racism or systemic racism in Canada, what it really uncovers for us is the absolute failure of our education system that would allow such a false narrative to continue to be perpetuated from the highest levels of, of leadership in our country. And so, but I was, in, in some senses, there, I was happy that it came from our leadership because what it really reflects is a well-established view about Canadian society. Well, you know, you mentioned that, and, and when I was listening to, to everything that was taking place this week, I was thinking about my own education. I went to, uh, to public school in, in Ontario, and I think about the times I was in class. We were certainly, uh, when we talked about black history, there was such a focus on the Underground Railroad and Canada's role in that. Uh, no discussion about slavery, the history of slavery in this country. No discussion about the history and the long-lasting effects of segregation in Canada. Uh, talk to us a bit more about the selective teaching and how that has affected perceptions and the ability for leaders to actually respond to the criticisms that we've long heard from the black community and other racialized communities in this country yeah you know one of the tests I still use oftentimes when I talk to young kids in elementary school I talk to high school kids I talk to university students I ask them what do they know about Canada's engagement with blacks and the first thing that comes out of their mouths no matter what level they're at is the underground railroad railway system and but People are so unaware of Canada's 200 years of engagement with slavery, the trading of black bodies. And I think it is this, because we, we need to maintain our national identity. And our national identity is one of we are peacekeepers and that we are the home of the free. We freed slaves. And we need to maintain that identity. We are known around the world as the most polite people. And it is that narrative of politeness that keeps this false narrative intact. Mm -hmm. So we, we need to continue to challenge uh, ourselves. And I think fundamentally, we must continue to challenge our education systems. When we call for justice, 
part of what we do in achieving justice is looking at the systems that continue to uphold injustice. Mm -hmm. And one of those systems is our education system. You're the education system, and you, you do research and so social policy, you know, without actually confronting Canada's own full history when it comes to the engagement of black people in this country, how effective can any policy really be? It really cannot be, because what we are doing in changing policies, those, those changes are quite superficial. We must engage in a scaling back, a peeling back of the very foundations on which we are built. If we, if we do anything short of that, it's only superficial change. Kathy, I'm running out of time, but I do want to get your, your thought, though, because here we have this national conversation taking place. I'm so glad you're part of our program today to add your voice to this conversation. Do you think this can be a catalyst for change, or are you worried that this conversation will go away with no changes taking place? Because we certainly have seen that time and again in this country. You, all you have to look at is uh, how many commissions we've had on Indigenous cultures in Canada. That's right. And my fear and my encouragement, my challenge to us is when the cameras have stopped rolling and the protests are over, when, when we are no longer in the spotlight, will we still commit individually and as a nation? Will we still commit to change? We cannot hope for change in one day. This Injustice has been centuries in, ma in the making. Change will not happen in a day, and therefore we must continue to commit daily to changing at all levels, individually and collectively. And uh, if anyone's interested, uh, the, the Canadian Human Rights Museum, for example, a great place to start when it talks about Absolutely. history of slavery in this country. Uh, Kathy, I wish we had more time, but thank you for the time. I appreciate it. Thank you. And Kathy Hogarth is with the University of Waterloo School of Social Work.